right. We last time we met. Uh, by the way, all the slides are up online. If you go to the content page of D2L, they're all on there. Even the one from Thursday, they're all up there to look at. All right. We, the last thing we talked about was CIDR, okay, or Classless Inner Domain Routing, okay. Remember, all that was was a slash, and there was a number of ones. Anybody remember that? So instead of a subnet mask of, so if I had a subnet mask of a class C subnet mask, y'all know what a class C subnet mask is? 255.255.255.0. So if I wanted to convert that to classless inner domain routing, how would I do that? Slash what? You count the number of ones. So, all right, so 255.255.255.0 would be? 24. 24. So it'd be a slash 24. You convert it to binary. Just the number of ones, because that's all we really need to know anyway. Because we want to calculate the number of hosts, we got to count the zeros, stuff like that. So it's pretty simple to do. Okay? All right. It says, superdating is created by moving subnet boundaries to the left. It's not done much. Uh, actually, I don't, I've done it once here, but it was like, eh, it's bogus. But it's really called subnetting. Okay? You're... Dividing a network into smaller pieces. So it's the same basic thing, whether you move to the left or right. It doesn't really matter. Okay? Here's a subnet mask of 255.255.255.224. If you convert it to binary, then you just count the number of one. So it's 24, it will be 27. What? Yeah, yeah 27. This will be 8, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. This will be slash 22. So instead of writing all this, you write slash 22. Some routers like Notopia support this. A couple different ones do. Okay, when you do this stuff for a living, you know, all this does is tell us how many ones and zeros there are anyway. So why do we need this? So it's a lot easier, but not many things support it. Okay. Windows DHCP server does, but it's weird the way it does it. Okay. They're just talking here about subnetting and supernetting. What they're, what they're saying is, see how we're using a portion of this? We're breaking this apart, that's subnetting. But when we break this one apart, that's supernetting. It's the same thing. Same thing. There's really no different. Okay? So that's why I don't know. They don't really. If you're out in the real world and you told someone you were supernetting something, you mean you're subnetting. Yeah, you're subnetting. It's a, same thing, except this one you're doing on the third octet instead of the fourth octet. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. It's like, why do you do that? It's, it, it's one of those, it's like way back when, remember I told you this chapter had the error? Remember with the number of subnets, they subtracted two when you really shouldn't? Well, when it first came out, you did subtract two. When, I forget which RFC number, which is request for comment, when IPv4 early edition of it came out, you couldn't use the first subnet or the last subnet. Just like you couldn't use the first IP or the last IP. You know that. Well, you couldn't use the first subnet or the last subnet. And someone says, why? I can understand the IPs because that's the network ID and the broadcast. But why can't you use the first subnet and the last? Because you can't. Why? So someone said, it's a good question. Why don't we use it? So it was like, I don't know exactly what year it started. Yeah, there was, it, a certain time period where they changed TCP IP. Then you can start using it. And what sucked at that point, one book would said you could, next book said you can't. It was, this book obviously still remembers the olden days because it says you can't. Yet if you read the end of chapter questions, you can. So it's confusing so but just one of those things left over all right so we covered three slides already doing good <laughs> so CIDR we just take it convert it to the number of slashes okay it says class C address IP4 sharing network ID need to greatly increase the number of default host addresses by what we did here we basically with a class C network we took a couple hosts there now they wonder what 252 is in binary What's 252? Um, it's 11111101. Um, one, 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 one. Right, zero. No, wait a minute. 
One, no, one, 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 one. Oh, 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 one. Sorry. It is zero, zero. zero. Yeah, it is zero. Two zeros, isn't it? It's Two zeros. Numbers, okay. So, so, the fourth octet has eight bits. So two to the eighth is 256. So by borrowing the two bits from this guy, 256 goes to 512, then 512 goes to 1024. So you can see how we can get very large networks by subnetting the next portion over. You ever have to, you ever hear that thing, like, which would you rather have, $10 million or a penny a day doubled for 30 days? Yeah, that's a whole bunch more money. It's like 30000 or $30 million or something like that. But that's what this does. It keeps doubling. So 2 to the 8th is 256. 2 to the 9th is 512. 2 to the 10th is 1024. And that kind of stuff. So. All right. All right, CIT or slash notation as it's known. Shorthand for basically telling you about it. You use the network ID followed by a slash and then the number, like 22. So if you have the network ID, instead of writing the whole subnet mask out, you just do it that way. And very few things support that. I wish more would. Like Windows DHCP server supports it, but you still have to enter it the normal way, and then it tells you that. Like, why don't you only enter it that way, then you can tell me the other one? It's kind of kind of weird. But. All right. Subnetting IPv6, simpler. Actually, these are new slides, so this might be a little different. It says simpler than IPv4. I don't know. I think IPv4 is kind of simple. All right. It says classes aren't used, subnetings are not used. You just basically get a whole bunch of addresses. Okay, I'm not going to test you on this, okay? But it's just a lot easier to do. They just really, they, they get, don't go in very detail. In my slides don't even go very detailed on this. I have to look at it. But with IPv6, we know we have quite a few, but we can look at them, and depending on what they are, you can tell if it's a local, national, regional, that kind of stuff. Uh, somebody said that, I guess in Japan somewhere, they're going to start issuing out IPv6 numbers onto people's driver's licenses. I don't know if that's true or not. I read an article about it at one point. But there's so many numbers, you actually could get an address, and it works for the rest of your life. So it's, we're I guess, the market of the beast. We're all going to be identified as a number. What now? We're all going to be identified as a number. We are. Well, we we're kind of are with the Social Security number now. That's a good point. Yeah. Kind of are. But uh, it's a really good idea to do, because people say, yeah, but, like, you know how we talked about network IDs and one network separate from another, but IP, IPv6 is a whole other animal. You can actually... Do it all differently. We're gonna we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. See, they don't really cover much about it. So, but I'll I'll give you a whole another presentation on IPv6. Okay, gateways. Gateway is a combination of hardware and software. Here, our gateway is basically a router. Could be a computer, could be a router, could be whatever. Okay, it allows different networks to talk together. Like we have an internal network here. We go through a gateway which connects to the outside world. You guys have a Linksys router probably at your house. That's your gateway. If you did IP config slash all on your machine, it would have a default gateway. That's basically how you get out. Like in this room, the gateway would be the door. Okay. And that's your connectivity device. Default is the one you just go to automatically. If you want to look, let me show you this here. Um, okay. This is a routing table. Okay. The book really doesn't go into them much, as I don't think they do. But this is a routing table that says, hey, if you want to send something somewhere or anywhere, send it to the gateway. How do you get to the gateway? Oh, you get through your network card. Some people say, but that's kind of stupid. Well, the computer's stupid. It doesn't know anything until you tell it. So you have to tell it where to go, how to get there. So, And you can tell it how to get to different networks. Okay, Like this is our... Class B network we're using, the 1010 10 network. It says for the 1010B 10, 10 network, uh, with this network mast, talk to your network card, <coughs> so on and so forth. But this is pretty much our computer uses to figure out. Um, is that a private IP address? Yeah, that's a private IP address. It's internal okay. only. Okay. Right, so anything, what this tells us is unless it's something internal, send it to the gateway. Then the gateway has two interfaces. The inside is that number. The outside is like 164.58.104. something. I don't remember the last bit. But so it's just a connectivity for us to get to the outside world. Okay. Kind of like inside your house. It's all private. But you have a doorway to get out. You have an inside the door and an outside the door. Is it possible to wipe that out? Yes, you could. And you can uh, add static routes to it. 
Um, you can only have one gateway. Okay, that's it. No more. Uh, when I uh, ever tell you the story about the Cox Convention Center, and now it's the, what's it called now? Oh, it's called Cox Convention Center now. It used to be the Marriott Gardens. Anyone remember that? When I used to take care of their stuff, uh, they had an ISDN line going through Pennsylvania. Very slow. ISDN 128K is all you're going to get. All the computers of with now the Cox Center and Ford Center went through 128K. They blocked all JavaScript. They blocked all Flash. They blocked all anything. It's basically got plain text. So it kind of sucked. Well, Cox Convention Center came into play. In other words, they put their name on the building, gave them free internet, and now they had internet. But the problem was, so basically now they have a high-speed internet connection. But the problem is you can only have one gateway. On your computer, you can only have one gateway. So they could either go out to Cox and surf the internet or go through the ISD in line connect to headquarters. So how are you going to handle both? So what, yeah, I mean, you can only have one gateway. In your, you can add two, but your computer will only use the first one. It's kind of one of those deals. You can add a second one, but I'm going to ignore it. Like an internal network versus well, external. Well, kind of. What we ended up doing was, I mean, they, they would sit there and they would change the default gateway to Cox, surf the web. Oh, now I need to connect to the financial software on the mainframe, whatever. Okay, rechange my default gateway to internal, reboot, do the financial software. Okay, change it back to COTS, surf the web. And that got old. And But I even talked to the COTS. I said, there's got to be a way around this. But they said, you know, since their home base in Pennsylvania was private, you couldn't go from the outside in. There was no VPN or nothing. So like, how the heck are we going to get in there? So what I did is I actually edited the routing tables. I said, okay, if you want to go, what I just I added, the one, it was 172.16.40. something. That was the Pennsylvania address. I told the computers, if you want to get to the 172.16 network, go somewhere else. Or else go to Cox. So I actually did that initially on each machine. It worked, though. So I, I added, you can, these are all dynamic routes. Computer just determines them based on your IP address and your network card. But you can add static ones. They'd be di listed down here, persistent routes. We don't have any on this machine. But I actually went to each PC and told it, if you want to get to Pennsylvania, go that way. If you want to get to everywhere else, go that way. And it worked like a champ. But you can imagine the overhead on my part, having to manually configure every machine, and they change something, and it would wipe it all out. So what I ended up doing was I went into the router, which you can do on your Linksys routers as well at home. I told the router, so everybody was pointing at Cox from now on. I pointed everybody at Cox, and I told the Cox router, basically I went into its routing table. It says, hey, the world's out there, but the 172 network's over there. So what happens is they would hit the Cox router and then do a U-turn and go over to Pennsylvania if they wanted to get to the company. So it <coughs> solved the whole entire problem. It worked like a champ. Then I ended up setting up the same thing for a VIP insurance company. It's the insurance clearinghouse in Oklahoma. It's over on uh, Northwest Expressway. It's the, I think it's the Oklahoma Oil Building. It's between May and Penn on the north side. It's a building there. But that's one of the, the biggest insurance clearinghouses for the whole entire state. Well, they have all these insurances connect into it. And they had the same issue that Cox did. They're like, man, we wish there was some way we could use the Internet and connect to the internal network for the insurance company. But that was when the internet was just starting. We're talking late 90s. Okay? And they're like, man, is there any way to do that? Because they were having to do the whole reboot thing. So I had just figured it out for Cox. So they contacted me and I did it for them. They're like, oh my God, you're a lifesaver. Because it's not hard. You just have to figure out how to edit these tables. So it can be done. But that just tells us how to get there. Okay? No, we're not going to cover that in this class. Sorry. It's not that difficult. But the odds of you ever needing it are slim, but, but the default gateway is how we get out, okay? A network nodes, this is allowed one default gateway. Your computer can have one, that's it. You can add more, but your computer's going to warn you, warning, I can only use one. So why add a second one? The only reason we did two at Cox is we would keep switching the order. Move up or move down as they reboot it, okay? Can be done manually or automatically, okay? Gateway interface on a router, there's advantages of it. This is one router can have multiple gateways. We, our router down the hall has two interfaces, one internal, one external. You could have more. You could actually have one internal and two external. All kinds of different stuff like that. Okay. They can assign its own IP address. Well, it has an IP address. Okay. So it's a default gateway. This is multiple internal networks. We could have multiple internal 
all going out through one. Grow state kind of has that, okay? We could have WANs, we could have internet. There could be a lot of different configurations for gateways, okay? Router uses a gateway, that's what most of us have. You gotta keep up with the routing tables. Now, most of them build them themselves automatically. You just tell it what the interfaces are, and it'll automatically build the routing tables. Now, we take the intro to routing class, you'll go in there and figure out how that's done. It's not that big a deal. You're just telling it how to get there. And you add the number of hops, and which is routers are gonna go through. Here we go, we have our, um, these computers here, that's its default gateway. For these computers, uh, that's its default gateway. Okay. Then the different gateways could talk to each other, since they're basically routers. So if, this, if A wants to talk to B, he's going to talk to his default gateway. Who's then going to talk to this guy? Who's then going to talk to that guy? That's pretty much how they work. All right, address translation. Okay, a row state, actually here's a, I want you, some of you got your computers up, go to a website called ipchicken, ipchicken.com, it's ipchicken, just like chicken, you know, chicken. Okay, ip, <laughs> all right, ipchicken, my address is 164.58.104.194. Does that match anybody? Yes. That's the default gateway to go out. Okay, so how, how the heck are we all using the same address? That's the gateway. That's the gateway. We're all going out through one. If Rose State, other than the cybersecurity lab, if you check any <coughs> other computer on Rose State, you all have the same address. Because we all actually share one. Okay? We don't need a separate connection. Okay? All right. We have a public network. Uh, any user might have access, little or no restrictions. Public networks aren't all that great. They're not very secure. There's a lot of configuration issues. Normally, we have private. We have some sort of router, and we have our network behind it. Okay? Private network, we have access restricted. You know, we have could be our clients that log in. Maybe they don't log in. Okay? Now, we all saw we have the same IP address. So if you're a guy on the outside world, how many computers do you see? You see one. You see the gateway, and that's it. So if you're going to try to break into this classroom where you can be able to figure out how to do it, well, it's a lot harder because all you know is there's only one computer. Okay, so it basically hides the internal from the external. But if he was to hijack that, then all the traffic would be going to him, right? That's true. Yeah, if he was able to do a man-in-the-middle attack or something, then that, you're right, everything would be going through him, and he'd be like, wow, there's a lot of traffic from this one computer. Okay? All right, NAT, Network Address Translation. What happens is, say all of us in this room start to surf on the web. Okay. Since we all go out as one address, say Luke, it is Luke, isn't it? Say Luke hits the router with his request for Google. It makes an entry in there. It says this internal IP address of Luke wants Google. Okay. It then modifies the packet and it changes the source away from Luke to itself. Then sends it on to Google. Then when it comes back from Google, it looks back up in its table and says, okay, where did this packet come from? Oh, that came from Luke. Then it forwards it to Luke. But it can do that with all of you at one time. As you want to connect to Google, you connect to the default gateway. The default gateway keeps track of, okay, that one came from Daniel, that one came from Luke, that one came from Jason or whoever. Keeps track of all the outbound packets. Then as they come back to the gateway, the gateway changes the destination and changes it back to Luke or Daniel or Jason, whoever. Okay? It's called network address translation. It says, gateway replaces the IP's private address with the internet address. Because, can you imagine, our internal address are 1010 something, okay? So we send a packet to Google with the source as being 1010 something. When Google went to reply, who would it reply to? So that's an internal address only. Google would be like, uh, this ain't a real address, so it wouldn't reply to anybody. So what we had to do is we had to replace the internal address with that one we just saw on the screen, that 164 address. And that way when Google replies, it comes back to the gateway, then the gateway looks in its table and figures out who the packets came from based on sequence number, and then sends them to the right person. So it works very quick, as if you can't tell. All right, uh, reasons for it. Overcoming quantity limitation. We're out of IP addresses. There are no more to give out in the world. Yet, 
I just showed you that all 16 computers in this room are all using one. So we're saving. Can you imagine if we each had to have our own separate address? That would suck. Okay. So get rid of that. Adds marginal security. Is it? I mean, just by having that, does it mean we're all secure? No. But it's better than nothing. At least the door's not wide open. We're not inviting people in. We're you know, at least got a little bit of security going there. Okay. You can use your own internal networking scheme. Most of his home probably use one nine two one six eight one dot something. I'm assuming that's what your routers are all set to. I changed mine. Mine's one nine two one six eight dot two. It's because I didn't want a one. That's the only reason. <laughs> And a lot of times people would bring stuff over to me. I have to configure for them. And naturally, their routers are always on one. So if I have their router on one, and I connect into my network and my router's on one, then the whole blooming thing dies. So then I put mine on two. That way, when someone brings me over something to fix, I can keep them separate. So that's the main reason. All right, we have static net. We can also do it individually. We actually have some of this going on here. We have internal machines here. We have a web server, a mail server, and a couple other things that we have static mapping. So it's internal, like 10.10.0.5 is our licensing server, okay? So 10.10.0.5 is the internal address of our licensing server. But on the outside world, it's 164.58.104.199. That link will never change between those two. 199 is always going to go to .5 internal. So it's statically assigned, okay? Useful with mail servers and other stuff like that because you don't want it to change. <clears throat> Actually, and I can even kind of show you what that looks like. Okay, uh, let's see. Do we got Telnet on here? Yes, we do. Okay. That's control. There it goes. Oh, all right, let's. Um, This is our router. This is our default gateway. Get into the interfaces. And here's our NAT mapping. I know it's hard to see, but I basically tell us the inside address is this 10.10.0.5. <laughs> maps to 164.58.104.198. So this is that static mapping I was telling you about. Internal to external. I can even tell it which ports. So I could say map everything or map specific ports. So this is the exact one we're using right now. So, like 195 goes to internal dot 10, 196 goes to dot 20, 197 goes to dot 40, and so on and so forth. But we have a whole bunch of mapping there. Then we also have a bunch of access control lists, which basically say let this in, let this, you know, deny. Remember we talked about all the in the private addresses. Look at that. Deny 192.168, that's private. Deny 10, that's private. Deny 172, deny 127. What that means is we're looking at packets coming in. 101 is our inbound traffic. The packets coming inbound from a dot .10 network, is that a good packet? No, that's a private address. It can go outbound from 10, but it can't come inbound. So these are quite complex to set up, as you can tell. Quite a bit of stuff in here. Good question about the 127. It's preventing like the type of loop back. Yeah, well, it's preventing the 127 from the outside to come in. 127 is itself. It's already in. Well, I understand that, but I mean, is that is that a way that somebody could yeah. crash a network by right. forcing a... Uh, if I wasn't back? checking that, you could basically send me a packet from the internet saying your address is 127.0.0.1. Then the gateway would receive it and says, oh, I got a packet from myself. It would assume it's from itself, and whatever the pack, who knows, it could kill it. Right. So, yeah, you're basically faking it into so being. Right. Yeah. 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 You see, there's all kinds of traffic here. Then at the end, we deny other things as well. So. Okay. There. Wait, is that a way to art poison? Or is that something different? No, art poison is internal. It's a little bit different. Okay. okay. Art poisoning. A little bit about ARP. Remember we talked about ARP a few weeks ago. That's your address resolution. It's the MAC address to an IP address. ARP tables have no security built in by default. If I walk over there and say, your name is now Luke, you'd be like, okay, my name is now Luke. 
And it's not. It's Daniel. So with art poisoning, I could go to the router. You know, basically, you know, say he wanted to talk to the router. He wanted to go out to Google. I could say, hey, uh, I'm now the gateway. And he'd be like, sweet, talk to me from now on. Then I would then forward his packets on. Okay? Because art just believes everything. It's one of those kids you know, that <laughs> believe too much stuff. Okay? All right. So it's a little change. All right, here's an example. We're mapping internal to external addresses. Okay, kind of I just talked to that. Those are specific ones internal to specific ones external. Okay. All right, dynamic NAT, also code IP masquerading. It's kind of what we do here. It's internal, but it happens dynamically. Okay. All right. uh, port address translation. This is what I do on my router. I have an Apple router because it supports port address translation. What I do with that is I have a packet come in, like a, I showed you all my thermostat and that stuff before, didn't I? Like my thermostat answers on port 21, I think. Well, external, it's port 21. It hits my router, my router translates it to the correct internal port. And I have a bunch of security cameras. They're all listening on port 80, internal. But to the outside world, they're listening on 8082, 8083, 8084. So they're listening on different ports externally, but once they hit my router, I translate them to an internal address. Just so I don't have to reconfigure them all internally. It just makes it easier for me. Okay? Not all routers support that. Linksys does not. Now, if you put the DDWRT on there, it does. But the initial, if you just got regular Linksys, it won't support it. Netgear does. D-Link, some of them do. But, okay. All right. Um, here was our private address. Okay? You can actually map specific ports to do different things. Um, a lot of gamers do it. Have ports in there for games, they want to connect to a gaming server, stuff like that. That's pretty much what it is. Okay, so you can see externally these have port 8000, 8001, 8002, 8003. Internally, all mapped to port 80. So we're just changing the ports, we're translating the port, hence port address translation. Okay, all right. Um, now we already talked about that, it separates out our private from our public network. Okay. The gateway does the translation. We talked about that. Most of us just use routers to do that, but we could use a computer to do that. Okay, that could be on a host. Okay, could use internet connection sharing. My son did a cruise last week, and Carnival is doing a trial on one ship this month where they're offering high-speed internet. It's a hundred bucks a week, but it's twenty times the normal speed and. and Basically, sports VPN, sports everything. You know, and, like, I'm going on a cruise this Saturday. I leave, and I have to submit grades on Tuesday, so I'm gonna have to pay for internet. I'm gonna have to buy their internet to do it. But you know, I get paid five thousand bucks to teach this class, so I spent a couple hundred on the internet. It's worth it to me. <laughs> but what my son did was, he did this. He, because uh, you're only allowed one device at a time. See, you could buy the twenty-nine dollar package, which is one device. That's it, and it's kind of slow. But with a faster one, you could have multiple devices, but only one at a time. Okay? <clears throat> so you have your laptop and your cell phone and all this other stuff, but only one at a time. Well, what he did was he connected his laptop to the ship's wireless. Then he rebroadcast with internet connection sharing, and then connect all his buddy's cell phones to his laptop. And he told me, that I came back Sunday, he goes, I said, how'd the internet work? He goes, it worked, but they asked me never to ever use it again. Because <laughs> he said he was doing Netflix the entire trip, a lot of the time. They were using multiple devices. And I told him, I said, he asked me if it would work. I'm like, in theory, it would work. But if they know what they're doing, they're going to be able to detect it instantly. Because they're going to notice another Wi-Fi network being broadcast and they'll kill it. But since this is the first cruise they've ever done it on, on the only ship they've ever done it on, I said, the odds are they won't detect it. Which all they asked him was, please do not use our service again. <laughs> so, that's basically what they were doing here. They were sharing it out. Okay. It, what it is, one connection connects to the internet, then you share that with other people. There's a lot of good uses for it. Back when I had a dial-up, I had two dial-up lines. I actually bonded them together so I had higher speed. But then I would share it with all the computers internally. You're kind of doing that with your router now. Your router connects to Cox, then you all connect to the router. The same kind of thing, but you could do it with Windows. You could have a wired network card and a wireless network card. You could 
connect with your wireless, share out your, you know, connect with your wired, and share out your wireless. You can, it's pretty simple to set up. Okay, other services, mail services, mail delivery, and mail transport. Okay. Mail goes out what's called SMTP, Simple Mail Transport Protocol. Okay. It's on port 25. Whenever you send an email, that's what it goes out on, with a few exceptions, but for the most part, that's it. So if I want to send you all an email, I send it out on port 25. It leaves my mail server, I mean, it goes from me to my mail server, from my mail server to your mail server, and then it sits there and hangs out and waits for you. You guys connect with um, port 110, well, depending on how you're set up, okay? But normally, if you're connected with POP3, it's on port 110. You connect, hey, you got an email for me, and you download the mail. That's the normal way it works. There's other ways. There's IMAP servers. There's exchange servers like they talk about here, which synchronize, which is what we have here. So I can check an email in my office, on my phone, on my laptop, anywhere, and I can see the same email on all the devices. The problem with POP3, which is the original type of mail, if I download it to my phone, it's on my phone only. If I want to get to the office, it'd be gone. So most places switch to this stuff. A Google Mail is an IMAP system. So if you have Google Mail, you already have that. But initially, that wasn't available to us. Okay? Mail clients, that's where we get mail from. We have Outlook, um, Thunderbird. We have uh, Entourage. Heck, we have the clients. In it. I'm assuming a lot of you check mail on your phones. Don't you check mail on your phone? Nope. Why? You, you don't want to be able to answer emails at midnight don't sitting there in bed? Wait till I get to <laughs> Wow. You're an anomaly. I don't, uh, <laughs> I avoid anything on the phone. Check the phone, text messages, and answer calls, and that's it. Wow. I, a lot of times I do more on my phone than anything else. I usually sit there. If I'm only checking email or something, heck with booting the computer up. I'm using my phone. Or my iPad or whatever. Well, when I upgrade to my new phone, I'm talking about Oh, you probably have that old flip thing. It's a dumb smartphone. Does it have a dial? Going. <laughs> Just checking. I don't know. Oh, so it's a BlackBerry. I was giving hard times about that thing. Okay. Protocols. It says uh, protocol response only. I talked about SMTP, Simple Mail Transport Protocol, in port 25. Um, I was uh, actually listening to a, a guy graduating with his master's degree from University of Tulsa. And someone asked him, hey, what's SNMP? Simple um, Network Management Protocol. It's for doing other stuff on your network. So what's that? The guy goes, um, something to do with delivering email. Totally wrong answer. I was like, what the hell are you teaching here? But oh, different story. But SMTP is used to send mail, port 25, like I said. Okay. All right, continues on. It transports it, sends it to the server. The server can hold it until whenever. You ever notice how fast the email is? Usually it's within seconds, usually. It's just wonderful. Okay. There's different configurations you can do on your server to prevent spam. And I did a whole bunch of research on that for my PhD, and it's just crazy massive. But that's way beyond this class. Okay. Uh, there's also mine, which is the encryption. Now we can send videos and pictures. You know, it all goes through as text. It's actually encrypted using MIME. So we can send it. Okay, SMTP is limited. What SMPT? It's a typo. <laughs> SM. It is correct on the other side, isn't it? Yeah, click correct, correct there. Okay, they, just a typo. Not only one of four thousand so far. This is a new book too. Okay, but basically encodes it for us. If you've ever actually looked at the text of an email, if you open up an email with an attachment in a text editor. It's like a whole bunch of gobbledygook ASCII codes, and you can't figure out what the heck it is, okay? That's how all this stuff comes through. It does not replace it. It works with it. helps us encode. Can you imagine if you couldn't send attachments? That's, that's the majority of our email nowadays is sending assignments or attachments or whatever, okay? So is it like a 7-bit encoding? Yeah, it's whatever. It's <laughs> when you send your text message like from your phone, it's like a 7-bit encoding. No, it's not encrypted. Actually, it's encoded by like a seven-bit. And your your text messages actually go on the S7 network. There's the S7 signaling network, which is like caller ID, that kind of stuff. That's where text messages go. It doesn't even go over the normal data channels. 
So when they charge for text messages, they're not even using the stinking telephone network. They're using the S7 signaling system. But they can keep track of it and still yeah. charge you. So. Exactly. They, they come up with a way to do it. And when I, remember, I had Sprint way back when with unlimited text for free when they first offered it. And if I'd only kept that. That's life. Okay. POP, Post Office Protocol. We currently use version 3. Okay, that's what you receive mail with. So if I send you an email, it would sit there in your mail server until you went and retrieved it. Okay, most of us using Gmail and them don't use this anymore, but it's still kind of used, just not totally. Okay, version 3, it's where we retrieve it. It uses port 110. Okay, advantages. Uh, when I ran my mail server, I did not allow people to use IMAP or store it like <laughs> Gmail does. Because I only had a 250 gig hard drive. We're talking 1998, 99, 2000, okay? I had a 250 gig hard drive, and that's all I had for everything on one of my servers. Can you imagine how much mail took up? So I wanted people to use this. Because what happened is you would connect to me and grab the mail. You were taking it off of my server. I'm like, yes, get rid of it. Yeah, I, I, no, I didn't want people to store it there because I'd run out of space. Okay. Uh, IMAP is what I said, a new version of this. That's what Exchange uses. That's what Google Mail uses. Pretty much Hotmail. I don't know. Does Hotmail support IMAP? It might. I know you check it on the web. But can you check Hotmail on a phone? Does it download yeah. or synchronize? It synchronizes. Okay, so if you, if you check it on your phone, it stays on the mail server as well? So yeah. that's IMAP then. Okay. Yeah, because that's what I do on time. So you can I see it on your phone them. and on the server? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, th I thought most of them were going to that, but I wasn't sure if they had yet. So, I just don't believe in how many. Sorry. All right, it was great. You can retrieve all or a portion. You can tell it to retrieve just the headers, or just the entire. So, why would you think? Why would you ever want to retrieve just the headers? What if you're at a place where they're charging you for internet, like on a cruise ship or something? Maybe you only want to download the messages that you need because you're paying by the second or the minute or the kilobyte or the whatever. So yeah, you can do portions of it, you can do all of it, and you can delete it, okay? You can delete them, you, know, you can do all kinds of stuff. All right, disadvantages require more storage because they're stored on your device and the server. But nowadays, with unlimited storage space, it's not really a big deal. Okay. Server fails, though, they can't get mail. Well, that's the same with all of them. You have an exchange server dies, still can't get mail, so it really doesn't matter. All right, additional utilities, okay? Um, transmission says many points of failure. There's a lot. Can you can you believe the internet's pretty large? Y'all agree with that statement? A lot of routers out there, a lot of different networks. So your your packet might go through tons of different places. So it can have a lot of failure locations. So a lot of times people <coughs> say, "Oh, Google's down." Well, I doubt it. The odds of Google ever being down are like zero. Now, could the one server you're accessing be down? Possibly, or could your router be down? Possibly, but is Google down? Probably not. Okay. There's a lot of different utilities, which we can talk about some more of those. They help track down the problems, okay? Help discover information about them, okay? Most are from the command prompt. We're going to look at a few of them, okay? IP config. We've looked at that one already. I'm going to bring that out so you can see it. If I just type IP config myself, it just tells you my IP configuration. Now, if I want to know some other stuff I could do with it, I could type help. IP config slash help, and it tells me, hey, you can run IP config slash all, which will tell you everything, or you can do release or renew, that way I get a new address, but not showing all of them. Uh, or all compartments. There's also flush DNS. Um, hold on. IP config. There you go. I type IP config slash display DNS. It's not going to be in your book, but it's okay. What this does is it tells me every address it resolved. I've resolved the domain controller, Yahoo, uh, Yahoo, and Rose Labs. I really haven't done much. Okay? Now I can flush that. I can do IP config slash flush DNS. Now if I want to display it again, it's only going to know, oh, I know why it's in there. You want to know why that's in there? You guys should remember if anybody. Why is Yahoo in there? That's the, um, you set up that, uh... Host file. Yeah, you set up that host file for Yahoo. 
Remember I set up that host file? So it automatically knows it because it's reading the host file. But I have a certain, now let me go somewhere on the internet. Let's go to, um, let's just go to Google. Maybe. Okay. There's Google. Now I'm going to display it again. <coughs> now I have Google Statistics. I have Yahoo. Yahoo. There's Google.com. 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 We've got all those different servers for Google. So anytime you go anywhere, it stores it here. And it stays there for a period of time. I don't know what the period of time is. But that could be an issue as well, because if Google were to change your address right now, I wouldn't be able to get to it. Because I already know of these addresses. That's all I'm going to check until my the addresses get cleared. So sometimes you'll have to do flush DNS to clear out your history here, basically. It's not really your browsing history. It's your name resolution history. So ipconfig slash flush DNS clears this out. See how Google's there now? If I did flush display, now Google will be gone. Yep, it's gone now. I have that Yahoo, and that's it. So that, again, the book won't cover it, but it's <clears throat> one of those things that if you're trying stuff and you know what else to try, that might work. So. All right. Let's continue. So IP config, lots of different th stuff we can do. We can put a slash and all kinds of information. There's an example kind of like I showed you. We've looked at that before. Okay. IF config, the same thing, but on a Unix system. Stands for instead of IP configuration, it's interface configuration. Okay. Use hyphens before some of the switches. Or you can always type man space IF config and tells you how to do it. So IF config is on Linux systems. I don't have one readily available to show you. But that's what they look like. Here's your interfaces. ETH0 is Ethernet0. That's your first network connection. Then LO is loopback address. No clue. And there's your wireless LAN. I don't know what that one is. That's your wireless. But you can see the statistics about it. They'll tell you how many packets it's received and sent. And kind of handy if you want to see if your network's working or something like that. That's kind of cool. All right. Next stat. Let's look at next stat real quick. Okay, netstat shows me the connections to me. This is my computer, and I have connections out to there. Okay, file server one is our server here. It tells you if there's actually a, a connection, if there's an established connection, and what the ports are. So I have three connections to something. Domain controller, I don't know what those two are. This is a way to check to see if somebody's connected to your yes. computer. If you do netstat, it will show you if something's connected to your machine, yes. If you do netstat-r, it shows that routing table I showed you. Okay. So if you're part of a botnet, would that show? Yes, it would. Because you'd have a connection established to somewhere. Somewhere, yeah. Yes. And then from there, how, do you, how would you... Well, if I was... Okay, so if I looked here, and I saw an external address, and I saw a connection established, but this here, they're probably surfing the web. So I have an HTTP connection established somewhere. But if I saw a weird address connected, established a connection, look at the address. You can go to places like Arin, A -R -I -N .net. It's A -R -I -N .net. And you can put in that IP address to tell you who's in charge of it. And if it's someone like in Asia Pacific or the RIPE network out of Amsterdam, you know you got a problem. Or Russia. So, yeah, if you go arin.net, top right-hand corner, put in that address, and they'll be able to tell you a general idea of where they're from, okay? All right, but, yeah, this is what netstat looks like. That's what the dash A shows you all the establishes connections. And That's a dash A. I'll show it to you again. shows not just the established, it even shows the ones I'm listening on. So I'm listening. I, I'm sitting there saying, I'm waiting for a connection on these ports. Anyone know why? Why am I waiting on 3389? Anybody? It's like it's a lab address. Actually, this is me. That's my machine. 3389? Come on, someone's got to know. You should know. Remote desktop. These are set up so I can connect in remote desktop. 445, 
is a Microsoft DS. It's a directory services, Active Directory. 135, 137, and 139 are all file and printer sharing type stuff. Because we're on a Microsoft network. Don't know what these are. Um, 161, I can't remember what that one is. Can't remember offhand what it is. It's something, obviously. You said that was ARIN.net. ARIN.net. Aaron.net. Did it not come up? No, I, I'm just making notes. Let me, show, let me show everybody here. Aaron.net, so I typed in uh, 66.210.163.130. I just, an address I happen to know. It's going to tell me, hey, that address is connected with Cox. If you do that, and it comes up with Asia Pacific, the RIPE network, Russia, anything <laughs> like that, you got a serious problem. So how would you make that disconnection from your computer then? On both the cable? Well. <laughs> <laughs> you have to find out what program is doing it. And if you use Process, the Process Explorer, come on. Uh, yeah, if you use Process Explorer from Microsoft, it's free. It's like Task Manager on steroids. What's cool about this is we'll show you which ports, which programs even. So you can actually find out, hey, this program, and you can even see exactly where the program is located on your machine. Then you can kill it and go delete the program. I think so. it was built into Windows 8. Is it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was from Sys Internals. Microsoft bought them out. It's called Process Explorer. It's free. But the problem with our computers, let me bring one up here. I know you really can't see this, but I have service, I have SVC host, SVC host, SVC host, a whole bunch of them. What the heck does that mean? Well, they're all, what they are is a service running inside of this host. But which services are they? Process Explorer tells you exactly which process each one of them is running. Which file is running it, then you can right click and close them out individually. So really, really cool, and it's free. Yeah, so if I saw a connection to Russia, I'd get Process Explorer, I'd go in and see exactly what program's got a connection open, close it, and go find that file, because it'll tell you. It'll say it's on C drive, slash program file, slash whatever the heck, and delete it. So that's your best bet. Yeah. Got to finish this today. Okay. Who's nope. that other, uh, what? Who's that other address, Aaron? A-R-I-N dot net. What is that for? That's what you put in an IP address at the top corner, and it tells you who the, who's the, basically the ISP for that address. So if you look at it and it's Cox or AT&T, you're probably okay. But if you look at it and it comes up and says Russia or someone else, you might have an issue. And that'll be a connection here. It'll say something established. And so you look at these addresses. You say, hey, who are these established connections? Remember, if you have a website open, that's going to show up like that. So a website will show up as an established HTTP connection. But if there's something else connected to some address, that could be suspect. All right, MBT stat and biostatistics. We don't do much with that anymore. Where's my mouse? Come on, back. Up, MBT. Now let's do it with... Uh, can't do A. There's nothing in there. I'm trying to find something. Okay, well, this is NetBIOS. You don't do much with NetBIOS anymore. NetBIOS was prior to TCP and DNS. It worked really good. So it's not much anymore. Um, that's why there's nothing in mine. Secessions uh, with NetBIOS names. We don't really connect via names. Like if I was looking to connect to Daniel's machine over there and start transferring files, I would have a NetBIOS connection between them by the name <coughs> of the machine. Okay? Provide information about the statistics, 
helps resolve computer names, but NSLOOKUP does the same thing now. Okay. Host name. Host name, guess what it does? It tells it your name. If you type host name, it tells you what your computer name is. Some people say, but that's pretty stupid. Well, the computer doesn't know. <laughs> Computer's an idiot. It's got to find out, so it runs host name and gets the results. I've actually had to use that on a couple people's computers because it was labeled wrong. Oh. And I couldn't connect to yep. it. And I said, do me a favor, type in host yeah. name. And then I've had, had that many a times. Or someone just doesn't have a clue. You're like, what's your machine name? Uh, I don't have a clue. Type host name. But then they type it host space name. I'm like, no space, just host name. All right. The host utility it says learn IP address from the host. Um, I actually. Hold on, is that, that one work on this? Here's host name, it tells me my name. Now, host doesn't work on this. I don't think it did. I wonder if that one works on Linux. It probably works on Linux. I'm not 100% positive on that, though. NSLOOKUP is used for DNS. We, try, we used that already a couple different times. That resolves names to addresses. Making progress. There's the name, Cengage.com. The first thing it tells you which server it's using to look it up. And then it comes up and tells you the information about it. Okay. Not an authoritative answer. I mean, this was a cached answer. So someone else had already queried that. All right. DIG is Domain Information Groper. It's used on Linux. It replaces NSLOOKUP. It's not available on, Linux, on Windows yet. Okay. Yeah, it comes with Unix and Linux. Does what NS Lookup does plus a few other features. Okay, you must obtain it from somewhere else because it doesn't come with Windows. And there's what it looks like. It's just like NS Lookup, but just can provide more information. You can do the same thing with NS Lookup. It's why I think some of the Linux people just said, you know, we want to add one little thing to it and call it something different so that we're better. I don't know. Same basic thing. Okay, trace route. We talked about that in the past. Trace route is how to get somewhere. If I want to figure out how to get to Google from here, if I did trade.google.com, and it's going to, it sets my packet with one, with a, dist, with a time to live of one. It hits the router, the router says, whoa, you've expired. So it sends it back to me and says it's expired. So that's where I got the first one from. Then it sends it out with a time to live of two. It goes through the first router to the second router. Second router says, whoa, you expire now, so it gives me its name. And it keeps adding one each time. And you can see we go from internal to one net to Quest, whoever Quest is. That's Dallas, I think. I don't know. Dallas and Atlanta, maybe? We can't be going that far. Where's Quest at? Is Quest in Oklahoma? No, it's Dallas. Oh, it is Dallas? Okay. So obviously we're connecting to Google in Dallas. I don't know why we're not connecting to one Oklahoma. But this is telling us how to get to Google. And this stuff can change. You know, five minutes from now, it could go through a different route. It's a cool thing about it. Yeah, then Dallas Fort Worth, when we finally connected to it. So we connected to Google in Dallas. Um, let's see, let me try one more. Go, connecting to my house. Now, I live straight down I-40. I-40 and Choctaw Road. By the way, if you don't know this, they're rebuilding Love starting next month. It'll be done in the summer. So we connect to the router down the hall. We connect to OneNet. <coughs> still on OneNet. Come on. Still on OneNet. Where you OneNet? Well, that's because I know their, their IP address. Oh. OneNet's our provider. Wow. Okay, now we're uh, wherever that guy is. Then we're in the equal whatever exchange in Cox in Oklahoma City. Then Cox, then Cox, then made it to my house. So 13 stops to get to Choctaw Road. You wonder why it takes so long to get home at night. <laughs> Must have been traffic around here. This is the I-240 interchange right here. It's got a lot of traffic. <laughs> yeah, there's 12 accidents here. That's crazy. All right. So that's the trace route. Um, here's an example of it. MTR, my trace route, comes with Linux. It's like trace route for Linux. Okay. Um, 
There's also path ping. Okay, it's like trace route, but can ping the path to get there. It's basically the same thing. Okay, differs slightly. Displays the path first, and then it makes a connection to it. So, <laughs> no real big. St remember before the numbers were on the left, and the path was the machines were on the right. Now we got the, the machines on the left, the numbers on the right. So, okay, fine. Yeah, I'll put different route. Is that routing table I showed you? You can get it with a route space route dash print or route space print or net stack dash r to show a routing table. That's kind of what we were looking at earlier. We're going to finish it. Yes. Okay. Um, fields. We have gateway. That's how we get out. The generic mask. Some different flags. It's not critical you know this, but on the metrics, what that means is how many hops does it take to get there? Is it one router or two or three? Normally, you, you connect to whatever is the lowest number of hops. Okay? Kind of like if you want to get from here to the end of the hall, and what's the shortest way I could get there? So you go by hop count. Sometimes you can program your routers to list multiple destinations and do different things, but that's pretty much what it is, okay? With the route command, you can add, delete, modify. I told you I'm not going to do that in here, but you can add stuff to it. You can type man route on Linux to figure out how to do it, okay? That's the end of the chapter. Yay!